I would like to welcome you on this Tonisti webinar. And it's our pleasure this morning to have two speakers, Dr. Laura Boyle and Dr. Kilin O'Driscoll, who are both coming from Chagask, which is the state agency providing research, advisory, and education in agriculture, horticulture, food, and rural development in Ireland. So the first speaker, Laura, after completing a, a Bachelor's of Agricultural Science degree, she worked with the French National Institute of Agricultural Research in France. And after that, she returned to Ireland to get her master's degree. Then she got her PhD in 2000. Uh, then she did research in the pig and dairy departments at Chegask. And currently, Laura is a senior research officer in the pig development department. And our second speaker this morning, Killin, graduated with a degree in biological sciences from Oxford University. After that, she has obtained two PhDs, the first one in applied animal behavior and welfare, and the second PhD in dairy cow welfare. And before joining Chegask, she was also involved in research at uh, the University of British Columbia in Canada, Purdue University in the US, and also Cambridge University in the UK. Her research focuses on the effects of management and nutrition on pig welfare and performance, and especially how early life experiences affect pig performance. So, uh, Laura, I think you are going to start, so it's up to you. Welcome and we look forward to listening to your presentation. Laura, you are muted. Yep, <laughs> the famous, the famous words, sorry. Okay, is that okay, Matthew? Yes, you can hear all, me good. I, all good, I was muted myself. Okay, I'm good, okay. Okay, thanks for the introduction, Matthew. Um, I'll just give you a little bit of an outline of what we're going to talk about this morning. Um, so there's actually a bit of a lag here. Um, okay, so first of all, a little bit of an introduction, go through the main causes of pre-weaning mortality and some of the risk factors. And I suppose some of these risk factors, the point we want to make throughout the talk is how um, we have some of these risk factors because of the fact that we're not really working in, in harmony, we believe, with pig, pig behavior and biology. And in contrast, then some of the solutions or some of the ways we address some of the issues with pre winning mortality are to start to consider working with pig behavior and biology. And we think this has been a neglected area. Obviously, it's the focus of Keelan's and, and my work. And we've seen significant benefits where we've adopted this strategy compared to more, more traditional routes that, that have been the focus of a lot of research in recent years. Um, in line with that, there are some, some other solutions, you, if you like, that, that are, they have a lot of traction out there, they're expensive, and we feel they might be tackling the symptom and not the cause, and therefore we'd be worried about their sustainability. And um, we'll talk about them in the end and have some conclusions and take home messages. So if we think about modern pig production and the modern pig, obviously we've had huge successes um, in optimizing productivity and economic output. But this has come at a price and the price is something we're all aware of, the, the, you know, the scale of production diseases in pigs, um, issues with longevity and resilience in sows, and of course the topic of this morning's talk, high pre-weaning mortality. And all of this um, is coming at a, at a cost in terms of um, antimi antimicrobial usage, antimicrobial resistance, which are considered major threats, possibly um, as great a threat as, as climate change, and the societal acceptability of pig production and, and, and its sustainability. And of course, the main concerns here are animal welfare and the environment. And indeed, um, if it, it, we can't have a talk, I think, any day without talking about the coronavirus and COVID. And I think this, um, this is a paper that I uh, was involved with last year where it has really also highlighted a lot of the fragilities in the production chain and especially in the pig and poultry industries. And that's the subject of, of that paper there. So there's no doubt about it, but that we've got to do something, I think, to, to address, address these issues. 
And if we go back to, you know, the huge successes we've had in terms of breeding um, the, the modern pig, and, you know, pigs have been one of the first domesticated species and the domestication goes back, you know, thousands up to maybe six or 9,000 years ago. Um, and a lot of the focus and a lot of the changes, and you can see huge changes even from the two pictures there, but a lot of the focus has been, a lot of the changes have been in terms of morphology, carcass traits and fecundity. And the historical focus of research has been on genetics and nutrition. That's what I referred to in the other slide. So behavioral biology has been overlooked um, until recent years. Now, it's actually been around quite a while. And Professor David Woodgosh was one of the first applied animal ethologists, and he did a, um, some, some lovely work on pig behavior. Um, but it's really only, it's really only now that, that, that the science is coming into its own and the usefulness of the science in terms of addressing some of these challenges that we have with, with pig production. So what David Woodgosh's work, um, I don't know if you heard of the Edinburgh Pig Park, and what he found is that when he put domesticated pigs into this very natural setting, they very quickly reverted to behaviors similar to their, to their wild ancestors, the wild boar. So um, <clears throat> some of these behaviors, and I just want to set the scene with some of these behaviors because they come through the rest of the talks. One of the very important ones is, is nest building. Um, and we know that sows in farrowing crates will perform nest building behavior if they're given access to substrates and access, access to space. Now, it's not really a focus of, of Keelan's and my research, but it does mention, uh, it does merit a, a mention here because there are huge um, advantages to allowing sows to perform this nest building behavior. It reduces the duration of farrowing, which of course has huge implications for, for piglet mortality and stillbirths. It um, improves resting behavior, the sow is calmer, better milk letdown, um, um, and the piglets actually show benefits as well after. You get optimal, better nursing behavior, better maternal behavior. And I would draw your attention to a really great paper in the recent proceedings of the IPVS, um, which is really talking a whole lot more about um, the work that Inger Lisa Anderson has done on nest building behavior and sound maternal behavior and how it could address so many of these problems, including those of pre-weaning mortality. And the other issues with pigs that we have to take account of, of course, we're all used to the, we're all aware of the social hierarchy and how pigs fight when they're mixed, but the teat order is also very important when we're talking about pre-weaning mortality because of the fact that pigs are very unusual in, in, in terms of domesticated animals in that they have armed sibling rivalry in terms of getting access to a teat and, and, and those who, as we all know, access the, the teats to the front of the sow um, are more, um, show, show greater survivability and higher growth rates. Exploratory and foraging behavior is again something, it's in EU legislation about the need to provide substrates for, ant, for pigs. And it, we're only gradually touching on this area. We're not going to present it today, but we've found some benefits to piglets of providing um, exploratory and foraging or facilitating these behaviors in the farrowing crate um, in terms of um, their, their resilience post weaning, we'll say. And there's an example of some of the substrates we've been providing. And then the synchronicity of pig behavior, how they all like to do the same thing at the same time. Pre-weaning mortality then more specifically, we're all aware it's the most, you know, the birth to weaning period is the most dangerous part of the pig's life. And piglet mortality is a major production disease, like I referred to in one of the earlier slides. And these are figures from our own data, from the Chagas pig cyst data, that show um, um, live born pre-weaning pre mortality of about 11.3% in 2019, with quite a significant range. Of course, this represents a huge financial and indeed more um, worryingly, from a societal point of view, an ethical wastage. Um, we know, of course, that pre-weaning mortality increases as litter size increases, but we also know that even with these large litters, the best farms can achieve pre-weaning mortalities of in around 6%. This is work from Sandra Edwards et al. And Sandra also produced this lovely overview of the complexity of pre-weaning mortality and how so many factors interact. And we'll just talk a little bit in more detail about now the three main causes of it. So we have crushing, poor, low viability, and starvation. So there are other causes, of course, we have disease, infectious disease. You can see um, very sick piglets there due to um, scouring. 
Um, and uh, savaging, you can see um, a, a nice uh, puncture wound in this pig here from its mother. Um, a lot of the theory on that is actually that it is frustrated um, nesting and farrowing behaviour contributes to this very um, abnormal behaviour in pigs and we have other conditions like splay leg and, and injuries etc. But crushing of course is an intractable problem and one that farrowing crates haven't fully solved if you like. Um, it's a major cause of pre-weaning mortality with almost 45% of live-born piglets that are killed, being killed because of crushing. And of course, we know that it occurs when the sow changes posture, rolls over or stands on piglets. And it's most prevalent in the first 72 hours after birth. Of course, small piglets are most at risk, but you all know that larger piglet that we find um, crushed later in life, which is so disheartening. So they're not, um, they're not immune to the, to the effects of crushing. Um, indeed, 70% of crushing mortality happens to healthy, viable piglets. And in my experience, often this can happen due to piglets getting their foot stuck in, the, in, in, in slatted flooring, which, which is a whole other issue of interest of mine um, in terms of farrowing house accommodation. Um, and it leads me on, obviously I've said it already, that farrowing crates do not prevent all instances of crushing and many, many other factors influence a piglet's likelihood of being crushed. One of the main ones, of course, being poor viability. You can see this piglet here, a very good example of a, of a piglet in a, in a litter. Well, this piglet isn't doing too badly, but really you can see the huge variation in litter size. Um, poor viability is a problem with low birth weight piglets. They have very low energy reserves, which means that they have very poor ability to stay warm, very poor ability to compete. That teat order that we talked about at the beginning, um, where they have to fight uh, for, for access to a teat, so therefore they get lower colostrum intake and lower milk intake. intake. And um, they also actually have a, have a poor, because they're weaker, they can't stimulate the udder as, as readily as their older, are, are their heavier litter mates, so they have lower milk intake because of that. And then we have this factor of crowding in utero, which means the piglet maturity at birth is very low, it's diminishing. Um, and I, I am, I'm sure you've heard of the term intrauterine growth uh, retardation or IUG or piglets. And some work by Amdi et al has shown that up to 30% of piglets are moderately affected by IUGR um, with about 7% of piglets severely infect, affected. And, and how can you identify this? Um, so it, uh, the classic dome shape of the pig's head is a very um, classic symptom of, of IUGR. They have a shortened snout and their eyes may be more protruding. Um, and they're, they're developmentally and neurologically um, much more immature than, than their litter mates in the, pig, in the litter that have not been affected. And they're very vulnerable to all those effects of, of starvation and crushing. Um, and in later life, even their cognitive development is affected and their resilience, perhaps through the whole production cycle, if they do make it through the, the, the lactation cycle, is probably diminished. Starvation is the third main cause of piglet mortality or pre-weaning mortality. Um, we know that 30% um, of piglets that die, um, they have actually no milk in their stomach. It's a primary cause of death. Of course, um, starving piglets are more likely to be crushed as well. Um, piglets born with very poor energy reserves in general, that's across the board, irrespective of their body weight, but they do rapidly weaken after birth if they don't get access to colostrum. Of course, they're very vulnerable to cold stress and crushing, and there's little protection against infection due to minimal intake from the maternal in, of the maternal antibodies, sorry, antibodies through the colostrum. And then we go back to those IUG or piglets, and, and starvation is obviously exacerbated in those. Um, these pig, uh, piglets um, are very much more vulnerable to starvation later in lactation, and they're less able to compete with larger litter mates. So they're the three main um, causes of pre-weaning mortality. And let's just have a quick flick through. And there are so many, we could be here for many more hours than we are today um, when we talk about risk factors, but they are largely broken up into the animal related risk factors, which are the litter size, which we've referred to, how long the, the farrowing takes, the sow's age or, or parity, her mothering ability, her genetics and her health status. And we've done a lot of work on the effects of lameness on, on pre-weaning mortality. And not surprisingly, a sow that's lame is much more likely to crush her piglets in the farrowing crate. And we've sat, found some beneficial effects of housing sows on rubber flooring during, pre during pregnancy, reducing lameness and having a, a beneficial effects on, on, on pre-weaning mortality. The environment is the, se is the second grouping of risk factors. So the thermal environment is important, the space allowance in the crate, 
as I referred to in my earlier slides, the provision of nesting materials, something that we really don't pay much attention to at all, has a huge um, impact on pre weaning mortality, water provision, flooring and bedding. And then management, how clean is the farring house when the sow has moved in? Is the sow um, induced, which has a detrimental effect, in fact, on pre-weaning mortality? Um, it can have, and um, whether supervision or not of farrowing and the provision of pain relief is a, is a, is a new area that, uh, or an area of interest that would seem to have an impact, a positive impact on pre-weaning mortality. But let's look at litter size in more detail um, for a minute. And it really is a great example of how we've diverged from pig biology. So the pig, the pig um, naturally has more piglets than would survive. And this is, you know, typical of the, the, the survival of the fittest um, theory. So the sow in times of plenty can probably rear all of them, but in times of, 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 of hunger or, or um, scarcity, some of the piglets will inevitably die, but you'll always have a few in the litter that will survive. So it's kind of the biological mechanism for large litters. But we've, we've, we've exploited that um, to an extreme, you know, where you can see here live borns of, of over 14 piglets with many sows and even gills having 20, 22 piglets. And of course we know, um, and there's two very good papers published in the journal Animal Welfare, which talked about the welfare implications of these large litters in the domestic pig um, in terms of biological factors and management factors. And to sum them up, um, of course, you have piglet suffering and mortality. You have potentially long-term adverse effects on the surviving piglets because of the competition they've undergone at the litter. Perhaps they were, you know, had suffered from IUG or, so it has detrimental effects all through their life. There's huge production pressure on the sow. If you think of trying to feed um, all, those, all those piglets, the very intense demand for, for milk letdown. Um, and then this repeated over numerous parities, it's not a wonder that you know, there's a huge pressure on the sow in terms of longevity. The management strategies that we use to manage and to handle these large litters also have negative effects on welfare. If you think of, we've done a survey recently where we looked at teeth resection, teeth clipping versus teeth grinding. And a lot of producers would say that they use it to, to help manage large litters. And this, of course, we know has big impacts on the pig in terms of providing points of entry for pathogens into the body and causing pain and distress. Keelan will talk a little bit more about when you take teeth resection or teeth clipping out of the equation, the potential beneficial effects for piglet robustness and survival. And, you know, some would question if we have pushed pigs to the limits of biological functioning and um, is it time to, to rethink that? Again, these are from our own data. You're all aware we could pick this data, these data from any country. These are from our own or from work that Keelan has done on some of her studies where you see um, piglets being born alive going up. And as I said, I didn't get a chance to put in 2019, but we're up at over 14 here. This is Irish data and a corresponding increase in piglet mortality. Um, a study that we did on a commercial farm where we followed a thousand pigs from birth through to slaughter um, and we weighed them at birth and we tracked them all the way through and um, inspected them at the factory even. And we found that um, <clears throat> piglets with the body weight of less than 0 0.95 kilos had an 80% chance of dying before weaning in that study. Um, the consequences of selection for large litters um, are you've got this crowded gest gestation environment that I referred to earlier um, and the, the associated IUG or piglets. The increased birth weight variation, of course, this also happens with old cells, but um, we have that was traditionally when you had the problem, but now we have it with our high, highly prolific young cells as well. You've insufficient teats for all piglets to feed it at the same time. Interestingly, on that point, even when sows have enough teats to, you know, um, even um, wild boar or, or sows that do give birth to the, the right amount of piglets for the number of teats they have, you still get intense competition for access to the teats. And you'll find that some piglets dominate two teats. So even at that, even with a normal, biologically normal litter size, you have intense competition for access to teats and a lot of um, stress on the piglets in terms of fighting for them. Obviously, you have a very high percentage of very light pigs, and we've been through some of the consequences of, you know, low energy reserves, ability to stay warm and to compete at the other for colostrum. 
So obviously some of the solutions are genetics, reduce, reduce selection pressure on, on, on large litters and some breeding companies have refocused to from born alive to born at, you know, to, to alive at four days of age or whatever. So, you know, there's room for switching there. Um, it's hard to see there being a major pullback on, on selection for large litters. Nutrition, I'm just I'm highlighting here some work that Keelan was involved in where they looked at L-carnitine supplementation and maybe someone might want to ask her more about that. And they did find some benefits in terms of pre-weaning mortality or robustness of the piglets. And of course, I mentioned all the management strategies that we use to manage these large litters, split suckling, teeth resection, fostering. And fostering is what I want to talk about for the next few slides, because um, in the course of our work and a lot of different studies, we've seen huge impact of fostering on, on, on mortality and um, performance of piglets. And this comes from work on cross fostering and work we've done with the nurse cells, which Keelan will talk more about. So when cross fostering is done correctly, why we do it is to um, make sure there's enough piglets on each sow to, um, to meet the number of teats that she has. And ideally it should be done when piglets are 12 to 24 hours of age, because then they will have consumed enough colostrum from their own mother. And the teat order wouldn't be fully established at this time. So the cross foster pigs, when they're put into a new litter, have some, um, have some chance of, of gaining a teat on that foster sow. Ideally, you would cross foster only larger piglets because they're better able to cope with stress and the piglets would only be cross fostered once and once only. So CF I'm referring to um, is cross fostering on some slides. But what actually happens in practice? So this was, I mentioned that study where we followed the thousand pigs from birth through to slaughter. And we tracked their, their location um, almost every week of, of their lives for the, for the course of the study. And we were able to, um, we were able to investigate um, what happened to them in, in the farrowing house in terms of cross fostering. What we found is that of those a thousand pigs, about 30% of them that were born alive were cross fostered. And a small cohort, but around 100 of them were cross-fostered numerous times. Um, so again, already you can see how we've broken those principles of, of good cross-fostering and really broken the principles of, um, of uh, you know, that govern pig biology and behavior, because this is obviously not normal and not something that would happen um, naturally. We were able to break down the pigs and um, to see when, when they were cross fostered. And we found that 40% of the pigs that were cross fostered were cross fostered in week one um, and 60% were cross fostered in week two or later. So of course, this is again, if you remember the principles of good cross fostering, this is not what you, what you do. And this was one farm, one commercial farm, but this has been borne out in many of our studies that we see, we see this happening. So what you see is in, in the first week, a lot of these piglets are being cross fostered as, as, as you're supposed to, to um, equalize uh, the litter sizes. But what we find is the piglets that are cross fostered later are mostly because they're being cross fostered because they're, they're small weight or they're perceived to be failing or whatever. But what's the effect of this? Well, we found that pigs that were cross fostered in week one or week two or later had a much higher odds of dying in the pre-weaning period than pigs that were never cross fostered. This is irrespective of, of, of their weight or, or anything. So cross fostering simply had a detrimental effect on, on survivability to weaning and this carried through to slaughter. And um, so the pigs that were cross fostered neither week one or week two had a higher odds of dying all the way through to slaughter. And we also found that pigs that were cross fostered had a greater risk of pericarditis and heart condemnations at slaughter, and they had lower carcass weight. So the detrimental effects carried all the way through. Why is this happening? Well, again, if we go back to thinking about our basic biology and behavior of the pig, cross fostering is extremely stressful and it disturbs piglet behavior. You get the piglets spending a lot of time wandering around and um, looking for a teat, not knowing where they are, I guess, and wasting energy. And you get an increase in fights that are completely unrelated to nursing, but simply the simple dominance hierarchy of the pig is when they encounter an unfamiliar animal, they will fight. And even in very young pigs, you see this. And then, of course, that cross foster pig also has to fight for access to a teat. So the milk intake goes way down and the sucking is irregular and you get continuous exposure to new pathogens. Every time it's, re it's moved, it's being exposed to a different bunch of pathogens and you get sickness. 
I guess when you see the extent of cross fostering, it's not surprising um, that um, piglets that are cross fostered experience growth retardation and are so and therefore are likely to die. And I guess an interesting question, something Keelan now is going to move on to is does cross fostering affect bigger pigs and, and um, she's going to take over from here and carry you through the, the next few slides. Thank you very much. Thanks, Laura. Um, so yeah, Laura set up the question very nicely there. It's very easy to understand why moving pigs around, particularly smaller pigs, could have a detrimental effect on their welfare and their growth. But then a lot of the time people make the assumption or have the assumption that larger pigs are, are better able to cope and, and are, are fine, I suppose, when you cross foster them. So I'm just going to talk now about a study that we did on a commercial unit. And it wasn't related to cross fostering, but we were going in and weighing piglets at birth and weighing them at weaning. So we knew at weaning then if they were still with their own mother or if they'd been moved. And we had nearly 2,000 piglets, so quite a large number. And we're very surprised to find that 44% of these pigs had actually been moved from their birth mother at some stage during lactation. And this graph, we split them into quintiles then from very light, fifth of them very light piglets, then another fifth were light, we considered another fifth midweight, heavy and very heavy. And we were able to compare the weaning weights of the piglets that were fostered and not fostered within each of these quintiles. So Laura, if you can just click on. So you can see here the very light piglets. There was actually no difference in weaning weight for those piglets, whether or not they were cross fostered during lactation. But as you move up through the heavier the piglets of heavier birth weights, there's actually more and more of an effect on their weaning weight. So the heavier they were at birth, the more they lost during lactation if they'd actually been moved around to another cell. Laura, click. So we've done a, a bit of work then on nurse cell strategies, which is another way of moving piglets around to try and optimize their welfare and performance, but it's carried out in a more strategic manner than just moving piglets around during lactation if, if there's a perception that they're failing. And this work was carried out by OCM Smith, um, who's a PhD student of ours. And I'm not sure if you're familiar with nurse cell strategies, but basically what it is, you've got a mother cell, and when she has her piglets, there's too many of them to fit onto the other, so there's not enough teats. So um, what you do is you look to cells that are later on in lactation to try and move some of her extra piglets onto them. So the first thing that happens is a cell that's 21 days into lactation, her piglets are weaned. So there's space made available on her udder. And then you move um, uh, an entire litter of piglets. So there's no moving of piglets between litters. The entire litter just moves onto that 21 day into lactation cell. And then when you've made space on the cell that's earlier in lactation, you can move some of the larger piglets from that mother cell onto her. So there is a bit of mixing there, but the aim is to do this within the first day, first 24 hours of life. So they, have, they can get some colostrum from their mother and they're all moved on to this new nurse cell, and at least there are enough piglets, or the, the number of piglets and teeth should match. So we found, or what OCM found during her work, is that there don't seem to be too many detrimental effects when it comes to welfare and performance of the piglets and the cells when you, when you use this strategy of moving around. And I suppose one of the differences between this study and the other one I described on farm was that we really controlled um, the amount of cross-fostering during lactation because the study was looking to see how piglets, how piglets fared when they stayed on, whether it was their mother or nurse cell during that lactation. But there's always going to be some piglets that need to be moved um, if they're failing, if they're starving or if they're ill. So when it was very tightly controlled and we only moved them for welfare reasons, we found that in this case only 13% of the piglets were actually moved or had to be taken off their cell. And the vast majority of these were actually piglets that had been born in the lightest quintile. So you can see here um, nearly 35% of the piglets that were moved around were actually in this lightest quintile. Laura? So we looked then at the age at which these piglets were fostered and for this very light quintile they were moved at about 10 days of age whereas for all of the other piglets that were born heavier these ones were actually moved at over two weeks of age. Laura? Um, and then we looked at the weight at which they were moved. And you can see here, the, the large pigs here are the green columns, the pigs that were born um, over 1.2 kilos, and the small pigs under 1.2 kilos are the, are the blue columns. Um, so on day one, there was a significant difference, obviously, 
we know there was a significant difference because the small pigs were selected because they were small. And you can see there that these small pigs were moved at 9.8 um, days of age and they were about two and a half kilos. When the larger pigs were moved um, at over two weeks of age, these were also about 2.5 kilos. But you can see that the rate of growth for these was obviously much lower than the small pigs. It just took them longer to be noticed that they were failing because they were actually born quite heavy. For Laura? So you can see here when we looked at the average daily gain, the small pigs, their average daily gain before fostering was actually slightly numerically higher than their average daily gain after fostering. Whereas for the larger pigs, their average daily gain before fostering was very low. That's why it took them so long to reach the 2.5 kilos. Whereas after fostering, then after they were moved onto another sow, their average daily gain actually increased. So moving them onto another sow did seem to have a beneficial effect for these ones. And then if we look at the ultimate outcome, which is piglet survival, we saw that out of the small pigs that were moved, there was only 69% survival after they moved or up to, like, to weaning. Whereas for the large pigs, there was a much higher percentage of piglets that survived after they were cross fostered. So we can see this, that the cross fostering did have a beneficial effect for those piglets that were born large, but basically did not seem to have much of a beneficial effect for those piglets that were born small. Laura. So in summary here, our findings about cross-fostering. Um, we're finding that piglets are cross-fostered long after the recommended period of within the first day, and worse still, some piglets are cross-fostered multiple times on farm. We know that cross-fostering is associated with a greater risk of death, both pre and post weaning, and this is likely caused by disease and by stress. And there doesn't seem to be a benefit of weaning weights to low birth weight piglets either when they're cross fostered, whereas the weaning weights of heavy piglets or piglets that are born heavy is actually lower when they're cross fostered. However, cross fostering does seem to be beneficial to piglets that are born of a normal weight if they are failing during lactation. So what can we do then to optimize piglet survival? So at the very least, people should try to adhere to the, to the principles of good cross-fostering. So reducing the amount of cross-fostering that's carried out and only doing it during the first day of age. Um, one thing that should be done as well is if you tag all of the very small piglets at birth, um, you'll know then later on during lactation, if you see a piglet that looks like it's failing, whether it was small at birth or whether it was of a healthy weight at birth. So if you see a struggling piglet without a tag, you know that this was born healthy and there's something wrong. Piglets should also be tagged if they're cross-fostered, so then you know not to cross-foster them again. Um, so then that will, both of those practices will really help to identify low birth weight piglets and those falling behind which may benefit, and uh, yeah, to ensure that cross-fostered piglets aren't cross-fostered more than once. So moving on then, just to talk to you a little bit about some management practices um, that we've done some work on. Um, Barren crate. We know these are, these are extremely common and about 95% of EU cells are managed in crates um, for very good reason. They're designed to protect piglets and they help, um, they really help ease of management of the animals and they, they were originally introduced to lower pre-weaning mortality. But the problem with them, I suppose, is that sows are really unable to perform those natural behaviours that Laura described earlier on in the talk. Um, and the other kind of issue at the moment is, especially in the EU, is that since 2013, sows um, are managed in group housing when they're gestating. So, there's a, so the sows then are consistently, they're transitioning back and forth between being confined and being loose, which would actually be perhaps more of a stressor than if they were confined all of the time, or it introduces a new type of stressor. And then finally, there's consumer concerns increasingly about the way all farm animals are managed, um, and particularly to do with sow confinement. So I suppose an intermediate solution to having the sows completely free in a pen um, could be to confine the sow at critical periods to keep piglet mortality low, particularly during the first three days, but then to leave her uh, or give her a bit more freedom at less risky periods of the lactation. So we did some work in Moorpark. This was carried out by Orla Canan, a master's student. We have, these are the two styles of crate that we have in our pig facility. So one of them we call a free lactation crate. So the sow can be confined um, uh, particularly during the first three days post farrowing and then the crate opens out and she can turn around and there's more space in the pen for the piglets as well. And then the control um, pens are just your standard farrowing crates where the sow is confined from entry to exit. So in this study, 
we left the gate open until we noticed milk let down and then confined the sow until three days post farrowing. So we found actually interestingly that when we used this strategy, there was no difference in um, pre weaning mortality. Well, we started off with a litter size after cross fostering of just over 14 piglets per sow, and um, we weaned about 82 to 84% of piglets from them. So we delved in a bit deeper um, to try and see why and when were piglets dying. And uh, outlined in red here, you can see um, the first two columns is related to the cells in the control crates. And you can see before day four, um, there was more crushing, uh, which is what you'd expect because this is when crushing normally occurs and then it reduces. Whereas the next two columns in the free crates, there was actually an increase in crushing after day four. And this is, what, this is because the crate was opened. Um, moving on then, if we look at starvation, we can see that there is actually more of this, more, more deaths due to starvation occurred in the control crates than in the free crates. And then finally, the last section there is to do with low viability piglets. And you see again, slightly more of these dying in the um, control crates than in the free. So this is quite interesting because it shows that even though um, you, the, the kind of the fear always is if you open up the crates or if the sows are loose, more piglets will die. It's just that they're dying of different reasons. And the fact that more piglets or fewer piglets in the free lactation crates died of starvation was also reflected in their um, growth and in their weights prior to weaning. You can see here in the graph that the piglets in the free um, lactation pens actually grew much better before weaning. They were significantly heavier at weaning and this actually followed through the whole way to slaughter. So, we realised from this then that there's more impacting piglet growth and survival than purely nutrition alone. Um, it could be to do with the additional space, it means that there, there's a bit more space for piglets to move around, interact with each other, avoid each other if they're fighting. And it could also be something to do perhaps with um, an increased ability to have contact with the mother and to learn from the mother, have a less stressed mother. Um, and there was a very interesting PhD thesis carried out a few years ago, not, not with us, um, and Bagman learning how to eat like a pig, where it was found that piglets who could observe the way their mother fed actually um, it improved their own ability to, to eat and to, and to um, learn how to consume solid food. So just another little example then of how um, reducing um, or when we took away a stressful procedure um, with the aim of improving welfare actually improved performance as well. In this little study, we had three treatments, control treatment for piglets that were managed um, using the standard practices on the farm. So they had their teeth clips and tail docked um, and it was standard farrowing crates. Milk treatment, it wasn't actually milk, it was um, an energy supplement that was provided for 10 days post farrowing in the pens. And then the teeth treatment was um, a group of, uh, or a number of cells where the piglets didn't have their teeth clipped um, after birth. And teeth clipping is carried out to, um, I suppose, especially when there's large litters, to reduce the impact of fighting on both the piglets' faces and on the sow's udder. So it's carried out for welfare reasons. Um, but again, it's considered to be a painful procedure um, and there is, ideally, it should not be carried out unless there are um, identified reasons why it should be. So we noticed here that with the with the piglets that weren't teeth clipped, they actually had reduced performance during the first three days after birth. And this could be to do with, um, you know, more damage due to fighting. However, between day three and day 11 after birth, um, their performance equalized. And then by weaning, they'd actually, um, a similar average daily gain to weaning, and they had a similar weight at weaning to piglets that were provided with the supplementary energy during the first um, 10 days after birth. So in this way, we found that just by removing a stressful procedure, the teeth clipping from the management routine, we had the same beneficial impact for growth as providing supplementary energy. So moving on then, these, um, there are some other solutions that have been kind of developed in recent years, mainly to do with technology, to try and address the issue of pre weaning mortality and, and poor performance, particularly in large litters. Um, you can see here there's an image of some milk cups to provide supplementary milk in the pen, um, a balanced floor which raises the sow up when she's standing so that the piglets, um, the aim is that the piglets can't go underneath her so then they won't be crushed when she lies down. 
And then the bottom image is just, it's a schematic of an artificial rearing enclosure. Some of the issues from these is that um, the piglets, especially if they're removed away from the south, there's um, few maternal cues. There's not as much uh, ability to learn how to feed. Um, with the milk cups, it's difficult for the piglets to feed in synchrony, which is part of their natural behavior. Um, and there hasn't actually been much work done with the balanced flooring, but it is quite an expensive technological option to put into a unit. Laura? So we have actually done some work with artificial rearing, um, and we did find that there was no effect on pre weaning mortality. Um, no piglets died. <laughs> And one of the reasons for this is that there was um, no, there was no crushing, um, and also because it was a very hygienic environment, very little um, chance for bugs to get in. But we did find that there was reduced growth rate, um, and this was actually quite dramatic by the time um, the piglets reached weaning age. And along with this, um, we also carried out some other kind of measures of welfare and behaviour. Laura. And we found really quite dramatic differences in these, that the, the piglets that were reared artificially had much more levels of play, much more levels of expiration, which is normal behaviour, and much higher instance of belly nosing, which also has negative implications for post-weaning um, growth. So, um, just to kind of starting to sum up um, our thoughts, reducing pre-weaning mortality, what does the future hold? Um, first of all, I guess a reduced selection pressure on litter size could be beneficial because a lot of the issues that we've described are kind of exacerbated by these larger litters and smaller piglets. And there is a move, particularly across Europe, um, to provide more freedom to sows during lactation. Um, several countries have written this into their national strategies um, and there is pressure from consumers as well. So this is something I think that producers may have to think about. Providing provision of nesting materials to sows and enrichment to piglets. Again, there's strong moves when it comes to enforcing legislation about this across the EU. So it's something that's very, um, well, it's beneficial to the animals, but again, it's something that people may need to start thinking about how they might manage doing this. And then also reducing the need for painful procedures such as teeth clipping and tail docking. So there's only so much room in the sow, and we know that as litter size increases, average piglet size will in general go down. And solutions that address the symptoms, but not the cause um, of pre-weaning mortality and poor growth are maybe expensive and also maybe unsustainable. So now more than ever, um, as our litter has gotten so big, it's really crucial to manage piglets prior to weaning um, in line with their physical and behavioral needs. Um, we know that facilitating natural behaviour leads to reduced stress, improved welfare, and this in turn then should Im improve performance and decrease pre-weaning mortality. So some take-home messages um, that are really kind of geared towards being of practical use. The first of all, keeping and using accurate records about why and when piglets are dying and sow performance is really, really essential to figure out how to reduce your mortality levels. Um, provision of nesting materials to sows and drying materials to piglets um, will help to keep the pig more piglets um, born alive and then improve their viability. This obviously necessitates supervision of farrowings at the most vulnerable time of their lives. Um, identifying and caring for at risk piglets at birth, so tagging those light ones. Um, ensuring piglets have continuous access to clean, fresh water from birth. Um, Cross fostering should not be carried out before, certainly not before 12 hours of age, and only do it once. Nurse cells we found to be um, a viable option that did not appear to have a negative effect on piglet or cell welfare, and supplementary milk sources as well do have a role to play, particularly in large litters. And then minimize inductions and use only cells that are at full term. So that means, um, again, it's to do with record keeping, keeping track of the exact service dates. Also, I suppose to minimize the risk of suffering and death in low birth weight piglets, try to leave them with their birth mother as much as possible unless you gather them all together and put them onto a nurse cell. Laura? So finally then, supplementation. I suppose this, this, is, this seminar is being hosted by Tenicity. Um, and they have um, developed um, a product which you will hear about later in the week. Um, you'll hear a bit more from by 
from Stefan Bozianu. This is a combination of key nutrients to help um, to feed the endocytes, which are cells in the small intestine. Um, and there has been a large scale meta-analysis carried out, Laura, please, next slide, um, on uh, a huge number of piglets um, over many countries where they have found that when this product is used as a supplementary um, form of nutrition, there's 20% reduction in pre-weaning mortality. Um, so with that, I'd just like to acknowledge um, the projects and, and the people that helped us to, to generating all of our data, or the projects that they worked on, um, the farmers and staff in the Moorpark unit and on the commercial farms in Ireland that helped us, um, all the placement students, our PhD students and the slaughterhouses. And thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Laura and Killeen, for your presentation. Um, I would like to remind to everyone that you can ask your questions using the, the chat function. So we have some questions already. Uh, one question is actually coming from Stefan, and he would like to know, uh, to understand. So you are recommending a targeted only if needed little intervention versus a blanket cross fostering strategy. Is this what you're recommending? Laura, do you want to answer or will I? You, you can answer. <laughs> so, yes, I would say, um, like it, a very targeted approach needs to be taken. So none of this willy nilly moving piglets around, trying to even up litter sizes. That particular farm where there was um, nearly 50% cross fostering, you could see the stockmen just gathering up piglets every day, moving them from litter to litter to try and, it was with good intentions to try and even out the size of the piglets within the litters. But unfortunately, because there was no track being kept of how often the piglets were being moved, it was actually having a detrimental effect on their growth and probably really stressing the piglets out as well, because we know this reduction in growth happens because they're missing feedings and they're fighting. So um, I guess, the aim just try and do it within the first 24 hours maximum 48 hours after birth if there's consistently too many piglets born across the entire batch then perhaps a dedicated nurse cell strategy needs to be brought into play because um in that type of scenario there often isn't anywhere that you can move piglets to you know you know a lot of the time if, if there's variation in litter sizes you can move piglets onto a cell that has maybe only had six or seven um, so, yeah, um, what we found is moving them around generally does not, it's, it's very detrimental to the larger ones and doesn't really have huge benefits for the smaller ones. As are we cross fostering too much from the, just from the work that we've seen on farms? Yes, in general, there seems to be, there actually seems to be more cross fostering going on than people realize, um, because often you'll find people producers will say they don't do it very much but then our experience of going in you know you tag piglets to come back they're they're moved around the farm and sometimes they seem to disappear completely and producers might not be aware even that they're moving them around so much mm -hmm. okay thank you so that answers i believe to the different questions that stefan was asking um somebody was asking uh, what's your opinion or have you tried the split cycling We haven't we personally. Mm. No, there is actually um, work starting up in our, our research facility at the moment. Padre Lawler, a colleague of ours, um, is going to be investigating some more management strategies and supplementation strategies for piglets in the firing crate. So that is something that we'll probably have results from, from the Moorpark <laughs> research team in the coming years. I mean, it's likely to work, of course, but you know, the downside is the amount of labor and the amount of increased workloads, like for it to be practiced properly and, and um, sustainably, it's, it's questionable. You know, <laughs> that's, that's one of the issues I, I would see with it, but theoretically it should, it should work, of course. Okay, thank you. Uh, I have a question, I believe it's from Shane. So hello Shane, thanks for attending. Uh, what nesting material do you recommend for sows in firing crates on fully slatted systems and how should it be provided? 
should the sorrows be loose in the crate for a number of days and then close closer in the crate just before firing is imminent? What do you think about all these questions? Um, regarding well, the I can answer the part about the Shane in our, um, that study that we did with the, the free lactation crates, we did let them loose in the crate when, we, when they were introduced first. And after they'd been in there for 24 hours, um, we closed it at night. So they got used to the, the fact that it was going to be closed for a certain period of time. And then it was just, I mean, it involved keeping quite a close eye to notice when milk let down was starting before we shot them. And they seemed to adapt quite well. Um, we did look at stress hormone levels and they were actually slightly elevated in the free crates compared to the controls. But we think this is because the cells had the opportunity to move around a bit more. And all of the other welfare measures we took, the cells did slightly better than the ones in the crates when it came to locomotor ability. We looked at tear staining around their eyes and the ones in the free pens um, had kind of better scores than the ones in the confined mm. pens. It's actually something the farm manager in our unit as well uses the loose crates for sometimes for gilts or the cells that might be a bit stressed going into the crates because it gives them a little bit more of a, a chance to adapt to being confined um, rather than the immediate transition to going into a crate mm -hmm. from the group housing. And I can comment on the, on the nest building material from the work, a huge body of work done in Norway with by Inger Lisa Anderson. And by law in Norway, they must provide some sawdust um, to sows pre-farrowing. And she's compared that to provision of long straw or straw in any form and, and compared to providing nothing. And there's huge, the, the benefits of the straw, of course, far outweigh the benefits of the, it's more functional for the sow. You know, they can, they can maneuver it, they can manipulate it into a pile or whatever. And because of the functionality of it, you get all those huge benefits in terms of improved, more frequent and earlier milk letdown, um, better resting, a shorter farrowing duration. And um, so you get more diverse nest building behaviors, the better the substrate is. And the better the nest building behavior, you get all these biological benefits afterwards. And what she's also found is that it's not simply the, the substrate, it is a, the combination of substrate and space so while you will get some benefits in a farrowing crate of providing a functional nesting material, you will um, you'll get they're added if they also have the space to move around um, prior to farrowing. So, but I guess even at a start and some really early work done years ago, um, I think it was in Australia by by Greg Cronin. I'm not sure they they gave a tassel and ropes and um, hemp bags for sows to just pull on. And they even saw benefits, and they were tracked in some of the physiological measures as well, benefits of even providing those very basic substrates to sows in farrowing crates over providing nothing. So it's incremental improve, you know, increases all the way up to being loose and having a deep bed of straw. But you can pull back from that. And I, I think what um, Lisa would recommend is straw, and what Keelan and I are proposing to do is to look for other um, alternatives to straw because straw is uh, at a premium and really difficult to get in Ireland, I don't, uh, in a lot of countries. Um, but some, some kind of functional material in a rack that's kind of difficult for them to pull out so they don't waste loads of it and they have to work at. And you will be able to tap into some of those benefits that we've described even with a sow in a conventional farrowing crate if it's provided like that. So, you know, you have to look at, you know, it's incremental um, all the way up from a rope to tug on, all the way up to being loose in a deep bedded pen with space to build a proper nest. But you're going to get benefits at all levels, but the best at the optimal, at the optimal design, I guess, if that makes sense. Okay, thank you. I, I don't know if you can read uh, what Shane is replying to you, but uh, is thanking you for, for all those information and uh, he has now some new ideas to try. No, I good. <laughs> so um, I have a question. Somebody was asking what about the pre-winning mortality level in the free firing pen? As far as I remember, it was close to 17%. Is it correct? But not significantly different from the mm. uh, control group. 
No, it, it was high actually, and it was higher than it normally is in our pick unit. Um, but it didn't differ across the two treatments. So um, it just seemed to be an anonymously high period of pre-weaning mortality in the unit, but it wasn't necessarily caused by the crates are being open. But the, um, level, the, the value was around 17%, if I'm not wrong. Uh, yeah, about 16%. Which, which is actually much higher than, than the average levels in Ireland as well. Um, okay. I mean, we did, there was a good bit of crushing, but it happened in the closed crates as well as the open ones. Um, and then there was more of starvation in the closed crates. So we don't really have an answer as to why it was particularly high during that period. It just seemed to be an unfortunate period in the pig unit where mortality was higher than usual during the time that we carried out the trial. Hello, can you hear me? I can yep. hear you. Yep. Yeah. Okay, sorry, I, I got the connection issue. Okay. So, of course, um, a producer who already has a building and firing house already available cannot change many things, but my question was, uh, assuming you have a, a producer who is going to invest in a new firing house accommodation, is there anything you would recommend them to do? Okay, then. I go? I'll go. <laughs> um, well, I think regardless even of the style of firing crate or farrowing pen that you go for, I think provision of enough space is essential. A lot of the, the, the pens and the crates that are kind of, yeah, um, certainly in the, the Irish industry that we've seen out and about, the pens are smaller than they really should be because the litter size has increased that much. And you can see from when sows are nursing, there's often a lot of, there's not much space for the piglets to line up next to her. Um, and then even providing more space, you know, even if the sows in the middle of the pen and it's not to do with nursing, it gives the piglets more freedom to run around, interact with each other, and it's slightly less stressful for them, particularly as they get larger and closer to weaning size. So I think that's something that definitely should be considered, like maybe a little bit larger than you had before. Um, I, I guess, I don't know how viable this would be for everybody, but I do think that um, if there is the option to put in some sort of free lactation crates or free farrowing pens, this could be considered. This is the way that kind of the future is going. There's, as we all know, there's a lot of focus from um, the, the consumers and from animal welfare groups on standards in the industry and on what's going on in the industry. Um, and it's something that may become more important when it comes to availing of, you know, assurance schemes or whatever to have this type of facility on your farm. So it's something to consider at least. Um, then I guess as well, if you, if you are coming from a background of having consistently extremely high litters, maybe putting in extra spaces and pens so that you can use a nurse house strategy if needed. This strategy it does involve having additional space because you get sows that will be staying in their farrowing crates for longer, up to seven weeks. And um, so you obviously extra space is needed for that. So this is supposed to be taken into account as well. Mm. And like I would maybe take it a step further. I mean, I suppose if it comes in and through EU legislation, there will be a long lead in as there always are. But if you want to get 20 years with, out of your farrowing accommodation, you know, to future proof it. I, I definitely think as Kidden says, more space and, and easy transition to some form of, of, of loose or free farrowing pen. Um, and it's it's outside of the pressure coming from society and consumers, you know, I think there are huge benefits potentially potentially to the pigs and to the performance and to their health. And with the challenges of antimicrobial resistance, etc., we have to start tapping in as the title of our talk says, you know, to tapping into working with the pigs' behaviour and biology to optimise um, outcomes for the pigs and the hopefully the producers eventually, although there's no doubt about it, but that the transition period could be painful for all. But certainly we've reached a point, you know, where we can't do a whole lot more um, 
in terms of, or we can't push the pigs a whole lot more in terms of um, performance and that without, without starting to work a little bit better with them, you know, to, to optimize piglet, uh, piglet survival. Okay, thank you. Uh, if you could please move to the next slide, I just want to make sure that everybody is aware of our next webinar. So the next webinar is actually tomorrow at the same time as this one, and it will be presented by Professor Richard Ducatel from the uh, University of Ghent in Belgium, and is going to talk about small intestinal absorption versus small intestinal infection. And if you could please move to the next slide so everybody can see the full program. So uh, tomorrow morning with Professor Richard Ducatel, then in the afternoon with Dr. Alphonse Jensman, who is going to talk about nutrition and intestinal development in young piglets. And then on Thursday, uh, I will be speaking in the morning, uh, talking about early intervention solutions for improved life performance of pigs. And then in the afternoon, my colleagues, Stefan and Eva, will be presenting our latest uh, data from uh, our pre-winning meta-analysis and all the conclusions we can uh, get from this meta-analysis. And some are uh, showing uh, things that people uh, were not aware of. Like, for example, we, we can see that a lot of heavy piglets uh, died during the, the lactation period. So uh, with this, I would like to thank uh, Laura and uh, Killeen for this uh, very interesting presentation this morning. Uh, for the audience, if you would like to attend the next webinars, if you have registered, you should receive a link. If you don't find how to register, please visit our Tonicity website or please visit our Tonicity LinkedIn page. You should find the information there. So thanks again, uh, Laura and Kilin, for, for your time and your presentation. It was very interesting. Thanks for having us. Thank you. Have a good day and good conversation.